You know that first song we sang this morning, Blessed Be the Name? Uh, He gives and he takes away. I'm pretty sure we sang that song uh, exactly 10 years ago on Thanksgiving Sunday. Uh, There's certain parts of that service that are burned into my mind. I I even know where we sat, right over there. You see, uh, yesterday was 10-year anniversary for us uh, since our son died. And... uh, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but it is well with our soul. Uh, When we lived in Kelowna, uh, I would go uh, trout fishing in a mountain lake that was kind of off the beaten path. But when you get to the bottom of the mountain, the the lake was right up there. But the road that went to it went that way. And the first five or six times I went to that lake, I always thought, you know, I must be on the wrong road. Because it would go down, you'd drive down into the mud holes and back up and over uh, uh, boulders and, and uh, hairpin turns and parts where it was shale where if you stopped, you'd slide back down the hill. Ah, but if you followed the road and persisted, eventually you would get there. Life can be like that. Seems at times we're headed in the wrong direction. And you know what? Sermons can be like that. And uh, I think maybe today's sermon is going to be. Uh, today is Thanksgiving. What we're talking about is giving thanks to God. That's the lake on top of the mountain. Uh, but to get there, we might take you through some other areas. Actually, today I'm, uh, the sermons, uh, I'm working together with Michaela. She's going to come up here now. And uh, uh, if we persist, uh, we'll reach our destination. But I I think we might be a little nervous today, right? So let's pray before we get started. Father, we need your spirit to uh, direct us. I pray uh, for us as we speak that you would uh, give us the words, that they would flow. Uh, We want to give you thanks. We want to bring honor and glory to your name. Amen. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good. Um, I am incredibly thankful to have this opportunity today. Uh, Since it is Thanksgiving, I thought it'd be appropriate to say a few things that I'm thankful for. So I'm thankful for my family, for my my siblings, and my parents who didn't bring me to Florida with them, but I'm still going to be thankful for them today. Um, I'm thankful for my grandparents um, who are very healthy I'm thankful for my friends who support me. I'm thankful for this church that I've got to grow up in. I'm thankful for the youth group at this church because I've never felt like I'm judged when I go into the youth group. I'm thankful for Canada where um, I'm free to say and believe whatever I want. And I'm thankful for an amazing God who will never fail us. So recently I finished a program called YWAM, which means Youth with a Mission. And so I went to Australia for three months, and I got to learn about God, and I got to learn uh, about the Bible and more about myself. And then for two months, I went to Turkey and Cambodia, where I got to do some outreach. Um, So when I got home, I was super excited, and I really wanted to be up here and talk about it. So when I talked to Russ, he said that Thanksgiving um, was the day. And I wasn't sure because I had a certain way I wanted to do everything and a certain How I I just had a certain way that I wanted to say things, um, but I had to change it. So I was a little bit nervous, but then I started looking at all the stories I had, and I realized that every single story and experience from YWAM and just from my life in general can be told in an attitude of thankfulness. So today I'm going to talk about three different things, being thankful in the happy times, being thankful in the sad times, and being thankful in uncertain times. So being thankful in happy times, sometimes things are going great and I'm really happy, but sometimes I pass it off as my own doing, like I'm the reason that everything is good. Uh, Many times I've done something good and I don't give that praise to God. It's easy to forget about thanking God when things are going smooth. When I was in Turkey, I had the opportunity to uh, preach at a church and um, so near the end of the service, we asked all the, all the people there if they had anything that they wanted prayer for. And this one man came up, and he wanted prayer for his wife, who hadn't been to church in years. So we got to pray for him, and we got to pray for his wife. And at the end of the service, she came for the first time in years. 
um, I'm thankful for God's planning in that day and that he got to bring people together in the church. Another time would be when my friend and I were walking down the streets of Cambodia, just listening to where God wanted us to go, and we ended up in a hospital. So we started praying for people, and we started handing out bracelets. If you see sometimes I'm making bracelets in in the service. Um, So we were handing out bracelets, and we had exactly enough bracelets for every single person in that hospital. Exactly enough. Um, And the thing I'm most thankful for about that story is that God used something as simple as a little bracelet to change the atmosphere of this whole hospital. In the happy times, we must try and be aware of where God is working because he's always there. Being thankful in the sad times, we've all experienced hurt in our lives. And it's still important to show appreciation and thanks to God and to the people around us, even when it's difficult. Um, But it's not always as easy as saying it and doing it. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with depression, and I started to take medication and um, going to counseling. In that time, I wasn't thinking about being thankful to God. If anything, I was upset with God. Um, When you're in these times, it's extremely important to surround yourself with believers who lift you up. It's important to continue to stay close to God, and it's important to thank him in the midst of your pain. So when I was on YWAM for the first few months, we had all these teachers, and there was this one really good speaker, and the last day he said to bring things to the cross that you wanted to surrender. So a lot of people brought their passports to surrender where they go and where they live. A lot of people brought their wallets, surrendering their finances. And one of the things I brought up to the cross was my medication, not just for the pills themselves, but for the whole, the whole situation. Um, It was difficult, but I decided that I had to surrender it to God. And um, and I realized that there were so many things I could be thankful for, thankful for in that time, um, because of because of all this bad thing, all these bad things that have been happening. I was able to relate to people, and I was able to reach out to people. I was also able to grow and learn more about myself. Um, When I was in Turkey, we hung out with mostly Syrian refugees. And so we got to present about Canada and about America and Australia because that's where we were from. But they got to present about Syria. And it was a lot of devastation. A lot of them talked about how they had 10 minutes to grab whatever they could and they would never see their homes again. A lot of them talked about how they're in Turkey and it's safe, but they don't feel safe because people don't treat them respectfully or fair. A lot of people talked about how they don't know where their family is, and a lot of them know that their family has been killed because of this war. Um, One of my favorites, Lana, she um, is a Syrian refugee that came to Turkey, and her story is incredible. So with her story, um, she talked about how her father was killed in Syria because of war, because he was trying to help his people. For a long time, she was bitter, and she was angry. And I can't blame her. I totally understand. But she learned to be thankful because she had so many opportunities to share about her story. And she showed that reconciliation is possible even in these terrible circumstances. Showing thanks to God in the sad times is difficult, but if you don't thank him, it could hold you back. And being thankful in uncertain times. My life after YOM has been a lot of uncertainties. Um, I don't know where I'm going with my life, what I'm doing, if I'm going to go back to school. Whether you're 19 like me or you're 90, there will always be moments in your life where you're not sure what will happen next. And it's kind of stressful sometimes. But I have to remind myself that it's all in God's hands and I don't need to know everything. Psalms 56 verse 3 When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. I am thankful that I have a God that I can trust and I can run to when I am uncertain of my future. I was in Vancouver a few weeks ago, and I was just walking down the street, and God was telling me, you need to give someone a flower. So I'm like, okay, God, you're the boss. I'll do that. So I bought a flower, and I start walking down the street, and I'm just listening, and I'm waiting for him to tell me who to give it to. So I see this girl, and I start following her, in like a not creepy way, but I'm, I'm following her down the street. 
And she goes into this building, so I'm like, okay, I guess I'm off the hook now. Like, I'll find someone else. But God is like, no, you don't. No, you are giving this girl a flower. So I'm like, okay. So I walk into this building. It ends up being a club. But it's during the day, so all these girls are just kind of hanging out. So I make my way into the circle, and none of them know who I am. So it's really awkward. And they all look at me, and I look at this girl, and I'm like, I thought, or no, I feel like I should give this to you. And I gave it to her. And I walked right out because I was so nervous, and it was just really awkward. But um, I'm not sure what's happening in this girl's life now. But I'm thankful that God um, spoke to me, and then he used me in that, in that situation. Another way to look at it is that that was actually for me. That was for me to obey God. Um, and he's asking me, will you trust me even when it doesn't make sense? By other people's standards, and sometimes my own, my path is uncertain, but God always knows. And we can be thankful for him when it's uncertain. We must get into habits of thanking God every day, whether it's a happy day, whether it's a sad day, or whether it's an uncertain day. Some days we don't feel like being thankful, but those are the days we must intentionally seek out reasons to be thankful. Once you start a list, it could really go on forever. Be intentional about being thankful to God and just to others in general can lead you to a better day, to a better week, to a better month. And people notice things. People notice and it could start a conversation about God and then it could lead someone to God just because you said thank you in action or in speech. Every day is different. And we must give thanks to each one no matter what it's like. For myself, the easiest way I find to give thanks is to remember how wonderful and faithful God is. Thanks, Michaela. Uh, that was great. Now, we want to turn your attention to uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 8 and 9. And uh, uh, before we read that, let me uh, uh, start with a question. And the question is, is God good? If we look at the world, if you look at the world around you, can you see evidence of God's goodness? Can you see God at work? Is God good? You might be surprised how often as a pastor I get asked that question. Sometimes it's kind of a generic question of, you know, all this suffering in the world, how can God possibly be good if he allows all this suffering? Sometimes it's more personal. And uh, recently it was someone who said, you know, Russ, I... uh, I tithe, I uh, treat my employees well, I follow all the rules, I pay my taxes, and uh, my business is failing. But the guy down the street, he cheats. He treats his employees like crap. And yet he's prospering. In fact, he's making money hand over fist. Is God good? I could give you lots of other examples, but uh, there's a question behind that question. And that question is, is can I trust God with my life? Can I trust God to watch over me? Can I trust God enough to place my life in his hands? Or do I need to take control of it because I'm afraid he's going to screw it up? The question is, is If God allows these things to happen, can I trust him with my life? Today is Thanksgiving. And if Thanksgiving is going to flow from our hearts, it's going to flow from a place that says, I know that God is good and he is trustworthy to show his goodness in my life. Can I trust that God is good even during periods of my life when I see no evidence of his goodness? The framework that I want to talk to you this morning about this stuff is uh, basically an equation that says no sight plus faith equals joy. No sight plus faith equals joy. Let's begin by reading our text. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. 
Now, First Peter was written to a group of Christians spread across Asia Minor. The purpose of the letter is to encourage them during times of persecution and suffering. The word suffering appears 17 times in this little book. His readers had become Christians, but as a result of becoming Christians, they were being persecuted. And they were asking, can I trust God with my life? Look at what happens to me when I become a Christian. And so Peter writes to them, and note what he says. First of all, he says, you can expect times in your life when you will not see God or you will not see his goodness around you. Verse 8, you love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Peter had asked these people to commit themselves to God. They couldn't see him. They weren't seeing him then. But they had committed themselves, even though they had never seen him. It reminds me of a story I heard about a little boy. He's a little pastor, a pastor's kid. And the pastor's wife was a bit of a clean freak. And always telling the kid, you've got to wash your hands because there's germs on your hands. And finally, the kid had had enough, and he says, all I hear around here is germs and Jesus, and I ain't seen either one yet. (laughs) Neither had Peter's readers. They'd committed themselves to Christ, and as a result, they were suffering, but they hadn't seen God. They couldn't see Jesus, but they could feel the pain and the struggle of their sufferings. Peter is saying, we can expect that there will be times in our lives where we will not see evidence of God's goodness around us. We have not seen and we do not see God. Consider the story of Job. He lost everything in his life, his health, his family, his uh, friendships. And in the midst of it, his three friends come to him and say, well, that's because God's punishing you. His wife says, Job, just kind of curse God and die. Be done with it. God's abandoned you. Now, at that point, during that period of his life, could could Job see God? Could he see God? No, he couldn't. And he couldn't see God's goodness. No amount of praying or fasting or sitting in ashes or begging or crying or pleading changed his situation. He was stuck in a dark hole. Had God abandoned him? No. Did it feel like God had abandoned them? Sure did. At that point, what evidence of God's goodness did Job have? Nothing. Did Job feel the pain? Did he feel the force of his suffering? Of course he did. But Job still believed that God was good. He says, even if God kills me, I will hope in him. God, or Job could hope in God because he believed that God is good. You know the story of how it eventually turns out. That God eventually demonstrates his goodness to him. It's not unusual for us to go through periods of time where there is little or no evidence of God's goodness in our lives. It feels like God is a long ways away. That no amount of praying or fasting or begging or pleading is going to change any of that. In Job's case, Job lived long enough to see everything turned around and he saw God's goodness again. For some of Peter's readers, that probably didn't happen. They probably were put to death because of their commitment to Christ. Look again at this equation. No sight plus faith equals joy or thanksgiving. If joy leads to thanksgiving. So secondly, love and trust him. You love him, back to verse 8, you love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with the glorious, inexpressible joy. Even though they couldn't see him, they believed. And what did they believe? They believed that they could trust God, that he was trustworthy. They loved him. As a result, they loved him. That kind of faith is demonstrated throughout the Bible. Think of uh, Daniel's three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're told to bow down before the golden statue. And when they refused to do it, their punishment was to be thrown into the furnace. But this is what they said. 
If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God who we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you have set up. Why did they take this position? Because they believed they could trust God. Even though, uh, even if God didn't come through for them, it didn't change the truth in their minds that God is good and they could trust him and they loved him. Throughout church history, many people have not been rescued. Some have been rescued, lots of people have been rescued, but some haven't. Look at the uh, book of, uh, of uh, Hebrews, famous chapter, verse uh, chapter 11. The famous uh, people from the Old Testament Hall of Fame, um, Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, the prophets, I could go on and on. People of faith, what did they believe? They believed that God is good and that they could trust him with their lives. But notice what it says in Hebrews 11. All these people died still believing what God had promised. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nobads here on the earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they would have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And then down to verse 39. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. They believed that God was good, and yet they didn't receive the things that they were waiting for. They were still waiting when they died. God promised them things, and they died without receiving them. Did God trick them? Did God trick them? No. They knew that their reward, their real prize, was not of this world. Look again at verse 16. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They were not looking for something that they that we can see with our eyes. Rather, a heavenly country, a heavenly city. They could not see God, but they believed in him. And their belief involved in God involved an unseen reality, a heavenly country. They believed in an unseen God to provide something they couldn't see here on earth. That's faith. They were certain about what they couldn't see. And often God's rewards to us are unseen. Let's go back to uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 8 and 9. Peter says, You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. You rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. An invisible God giving an invisible gift. The invisible gift is the salvation of your souls. Your soul is invisible. The salvation of your soul can't be seen by human eyes. But look again at the equation. An unseen God plus faith and something that can't be seen, God, results in joy, which is at the root of thanksgiving. Verse 8, uh, basically, if you divide it into five parts, it says, you've not seen God. In the past, you haven't seen God, and you can't see him now. But even though you are going through a long period of time where there is no evidence of God's goodness, You can believe that he is good, and you can trust him with your life. Then you will experience joy, the joy of the Holy Spirit in your life. Peter calls it an inexpressible and glorious joy. 
the level of joy that the Holy Spirit gives us is directly in proportion to the level of faith we have in this invisible God. You may be going through a dark time right now. All is black around you. There is no sign of God's goodness that you can discern anywhere around you. It may feel that God has left you, but it doesn't mean that he has. It feels like it, but God is still with you. Can you trust him with your life? Or do you need to step in and take charge because God is messing things up? That's a question we all need to deal with. The invisible God says to us, trust me with your life. Your reward will be twofold. In the future, it's the invisible salvation of your soul, a heavenly city. And now, here in this life, it is joy. I conclude with a story that I got from an SIM letter. Uh, Sharon's sister is a missionary in West Africa with an organization just called SIM. And this letter came from her organization. It's about a teenage girl who uh, became a Christian. And she lives, uh, her family is Muslim. She lives with her, or lived with her Muslim parents. But when they found out that she'd become a Christian, her father uh, threw her out of the house. And then quickly ran out and said, you know, even your clothes belong to me. And uh, ripped off her clothes and she was left completely naked, thrown out of her house. And she had nowhere to go other than she knew of a friend who lived across this, uh, on the other side of the, of the town. But she didn't know exactly where that house, where, where she lived. So she had to find this place and she was uh, stark naked. And so she made her way to the general area where she knew the house would be. Saw these four guys, teenage guys, playing table tennis. And she asked them for direction. And they pointed her to, here's your friend's house right here. And uh, her friend came home a little bit later and found her hiding naked in her house. And, uh, and the friend says, well, did anybody see you? And the girl said, I don't, I don't think anybody saw me other than those four guys that I asked for, for, for direction. And so later the lady went and asked these four guys, you know, did, did you see anybody? And they said, oh, yeah, there was one, one lady that uh, stopped to ask for directions. We, we pointed her to your, she's in your house right now. You know, that lady in the white dress. Now, did God do something for this girl? What do you think? God, God did something for this girl. Does that mean that, uh, that she's not going to go through a hard time? Well, of course she's still going through a hard time. She was, she was uh, kicked out of, her, out of her family, out of her... She, she experiences a dark time. And a continuing dark time as, as she now has to live without her parents and, and siblings. But God provided for her. Didn't necessarily make everything in life comfortable for her. But he provided for her. God is good. He gives us, we are receiving an invisible reward the salvation of our souls. And so is this girl. And one thing I know about her, she will also be filled with joy. For when we take an unseen God and we add to that our faith, it results in an inexpressible and glorious joy from the Holy Spirit. Such is the root of true thanksgiving in our lives. Let's pray. Father, on Thanksgiving, we stop to give you thanks. That thanks comes from the joy that you uh, place into our lives. We thank you for the invisible uh, reward that you give to us, the salvation of our souls. That stirs faith within us. And so we pray that your joy would bubble forth and our lives resulting in great thanksgiving towards you. We pray this in the name of Christ.
Amen.